Welcome to the second installment of Speaking of Poetry. Our guest today is Ginny Connors uh, from West Hartford. She is a teacher in the Sedgwick Middle School, has uh, two books to her credit, as well as uh, three edited books, and uh, was the 2010 winner of the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival. She will read us poems. Uh, you will seldom see Ginny smile, but uh, she's uh, being the master of irony, uh, a very funny as well as a very moving poet. Welcome, Ginny Connors. Thank you, Rennie. I'm going to start by reading a poem called Ordinary Time. Time is an interesting concept to work with in poetry. I don't really think of it as being linear, starting in the past and moving in a straight line toward the future. I think of time as being in several planes of existence all at once so that you always carry your past with you and you always have within you some of your future. This poem, Ordinary Time, uh, takes place during the summer, which is a season during which time seems particularly spacious to me. Ordinary time. We're on the deck, easy with our drinks, our faint sunburns, that summer feeling we've escaped from ordinary time. There, out at the island, three teenagers fooling around at the rope swing. Against the sun, we see their silhouettes swinging back and forth, hear their laughter and the loud punctuation of young bodies hitting water. The trick is to swing straight out and let go at the apex over deep water, beyond the boulders that lurk close to shore. One of the boys out at the rope now swings back and forth, back, reluctant to face that brief terror of hanging on to nothing. A girl in the water laughs at him, shouts, Michael, come on. Wind pushes sheets of silver across the lake, hiding whatever weeds or stones await beneath the surface. The boy at last lets go. There's no way to refuse the future. His splash joins the others, and he surfaces with a shout that sounds like a yodel. Closer to us, a child's inflatable ball floats by, twirling and scudding as the breeze puffs and pauses. And my thoughts take me to a different lake, and I'm a child again, in a boat with my brother and papa. When my grandpa falls overboard, half the lake rises up, the rowboat rocks hard, and papa's hat floats in the long suspense before he reappears, spouting water like a whale. He is a beautiful man, huge in his kindness, exuberant, clumsy. But somehow childhood dissolves and now Papa is an old felt hat floating in my memory. Beside me, my husband puts down his beer calls the dog to him for a quick moment, hugs him tight. The dog's white-tipped tail beats like a metronome. Out at the island, the rope swings empty. The kids head for shore. Rowdy insults float over the water. I turn to my husband and do not say, oh, what will become of us? And I do not say, I love sharing these moments with you. Oh, why? Why don't I say it? Instead, I show him the tomatoes, firm and perfectly ripe. I give him the fresh fish ready for grilling. I slap a mosquito that's stealing my blood. I chop the basil. That was ordinary time. The next poem I'm going to read is called Sweet Molasses. In a way, this is also a poem about time. In this poem, time dissolves forward and back, and uh, places change also. 
The poem begins in a basement schoolroom where music was taught to us in elementary school. Sweet Molasses. In a basement room, the music teacher's hands lift and fall, white birds on the keyboard. Smelling of cinnamon, Danny Morgan leans toward me, humming his two flat notes. Lorraine Rothman opens her large pink mouth to sing like a bell, her tongue a clapper refusing to rest. Every song a river, and we, the fifth graders, living stones the music burbles over and past. I watch the teacher's hands turn into white canoes. My brother, with the patience of a rock, untangles my fishing line. We sway together in the wooden boat as mist lifts slowly from the lake. Well, sweet molasses, you are a peck of trouble to take along, he tells me like a grandfather, because it was Papa who taught us to fish. My brother loosens another knot, hands me the last piece of melon and a knife to cut it with. New moon dipped into well water. It tastes that cool, that smooth. And so I fall into the green grass of my brother's kindness. November, though, is nothing but a cage of dead leaves and drafty schoolrooms. I take off my shoe and watch it sail toward the window. Kiddo is sent home with a note for mother to read. For the rest of her life, that girl hates saddle shoes and basements. Lorraine draws boxes of words, steps neatly across them into a judge's robes, ticking all the while like a clock. Danny Morgan disappears, so that every year or two in a crowd, I spy the back of his curly head. The next poem I'm going to read is called Silence and Disorder. Two opposites, I often uh, find working with opposites is very interesting in poetry and um, very similar to my experience of life, the tension between opposing forces. Silence is something that was often imposed upon me as a child. And disorder is something that was not imposed on me, but that I was able to bring quite naturally into many scenes. Silence and disorder. Start a ruckus and get noticed, banished. To be quiet and well-behaved, that's the first lesson. Still, something in me kept refusing to lie down. I wanted to yodel or hang by the knees, a pendulum. Energy made me. And how do you kill that? Sit still. Don't shout. But I could do six backwards somersaults before running out of room. At night sometimes, I listen to the stars calling out with their voices of silver light. In school, I'd stare out the window, feeling the chaos of the universe zinging around, wind in the branches and Loops of blue radiance stretched tight and quivering, rubber bands of light. I tried to find the wormhole. Sometimes in empty fields or late at night, I could feel my way through. Cave of silence, inner sight. I threw stones at a neighbor's house. An engine drove me to it to get as close as I could to breaking the glass without quite hitting it. I cried when the window broke. Aria of stone hitting the almost window, gone now for good, leaving just me, bad and unstill. Summers I'd perch in a rusty tree till lunch. Beetles bore into the bark, buzzed off, icing glass win wings carrying their solid bodies away. Later, I'd spin like a top, fall down, the world still spinning, which was truth finding me. 
the fire of that world between motion and stillness, clouds burning brilliant as the sun erased itself. That part in there about um, finding the wormhole or the, the cave of silence, the inner sight, I think is the impulse of art to find a stillness within the chaos of the universe and to make some kind of sense of it. So even as a child, I felt that pull. I'm going to read a poem next called Optical Allus Longings and Illusions. The title comes from a collage by Man Ray, a multimedia collage that has a variety of somewhat disjointed images in it. And looking at the collage, I got that feeling like I had in high school, trying to fit into different worlds that high school offers or demands. I also mention in this poem one of the classes, a science class, that I found particularly difficult. So again, this is Optical Longings and Illusions. Kinetic energy. Write this down, Mr. Lewis said. Chemical reactions. Zigzagging through the corridors, I colored myself in. The blackboard marked with chains of letters, pluses and minuses clustering around them, circles, arrows, longing as loss of electrons. I saw constellations missing their lucky stars, random lines connecting emptiness to emptiness across the dark night that had us surrounded. Oh, Mr. Lewis, big ears and bow ties. But there was something he knew, dark matter, chalk dust to me. My elemental landscape was tending toward train tracks, bridges suspended over air, snow melting. Gravitational laws, he said, changing forms. Desk to desk, we passed back the mimeographs with their purple ink, inhaled their fumes as if life alone was not enough to make us dizzy. My best friend turned into a paper doll. I watched her disappear, solar flare. The uh, purple mimeographs kind of gives my age away here. Don't see those in school anymore. Despite my um, less than stellar performance as a student. I went on to become a teacher. I'm still a teacher and I often write about experiences suggested by my work. So I brought two poems about teaching. One is called Anthony After School. It's based on a real student I had a number of years ago, <clears throat> although his real name was not Anthony. In the poem I'm trying to offer him a little understanding but I end up reverting back into my teacher role, my disciplinarian role, because that's just kind of hard to avoid when you're doing the job. Anthony after school. After the stink bomb, I told him I thought he was a good boy. But when someone brought paint bombs to school, splattering the walls neon green and yellow, like geckos running wild, in the tired hallways, he was right there. When someone lined up fake turds near a fat girl's chair, so the girl turned red and cried, I knew she would never forget that day, and he was right there. When there was shoving in the hallway, voices rising like an angry wind, the clattering of someone's bones banging up against a locker. Once again, he was right there. A certain reputation starts to form, I warned this wisp of a boy. It perches on the shoulder like a crow that won't leave. When trouble flaps its heavy wings, squawking, people glance his way. I meant to tell him, I believe in the possibilities his life still holds, despite a beginning sad as threadbare socks. I meant to 
Give him something he could cradle in his arms. Hope, maybe. But I talked only of failure, how people look at him and think, it's that boy's fault. While Anthony listened politely, I noticed his soft hair parted neatly down the middle, how it settled like wings across his forehead. The other teaching poem I brought is a pantoum, which is a form that requires repetition of certain lines in a particular order. This is based on um, a number of different students that I rolled into one and called him Travis, trying to teach Travis. On his arm, he's drawing two snakes. His fingers are busy and green. His beautiful eyes are great salt lakes and his mind is a submarine. His fingers are busy and green, and I ask for his homework in vain. This boy's mind is a submarine, and his book was left out in the rain. I ask for his homework in vain. His sister ran off last night, and his book was left out in the rain. He says there was some kind of fight. His sister ran off last night. He's pouring a puddle of glue. He says there was some kind of fight, but the things that were shouted aren't true. He's pouring a puddle of glue. His beautiful eyes are great salt lakes, and the things that were shouted aren't true. On his arm, he's drawing two snakes. I'm going to go to a poem called Wheat Field with Crows. This is another poem based on a piece of art, a painting by Vincent van Gogh. Um, one thing that struck me about this painting is the contrast of the light and dark in the painting. There's a wheat field that is just glowing with light, and in the background of the picture are dark wings of crows rising up. So this is my take on the painting. Wheat field with crows. From fields lush with wheat, they rise up, those old black sorrows crying out my name, taking pleasure in it too. Like the stiff straw men abandoned there, coming unhinged, they flap and stir the chaff to storms of dust, golden dust. What crooked rut is this that wanders? a little green into the grain of squawking crows. Even when I believe I've left the world's restless errands behind, an agitation follows me. In this incandescent world, the sky comes roiling closer, bearing again its difficult night. I often write about animals in my poetry. Um, the next one is about an animal, a manatee. Uh, as you probably know, manatees are large aquatic mammals. Uh, they are sometimes called sea cows, and they like shallow waters, warm waters. I do know that when Christopher Columbus and his sailors were approaching the New World, reportedly they saw some manatees and thought they were mermaids which is pretty hard to credit because they are interesting animals, but not what I would call beautiful. They're large, they have whiskered faces, but I guess if you've been out to sea long enough, even a manatee looks good. Manatee. Across a rubber raft, I lean my awkward elbows, watching light on the water break apart and mend itself over and over until I notice your voluptuous drift. A blimp trundling lazy and smooth through water, you're slow as the nothing days, the nowhere days, that drop away, that turn and turn when I retreat from the hard work of living into puddles half remembered. Your shadow glides a cloud and then you surface breathing noisily and I am graced with a glimpse of you. Buddha of the coastal waters. Close up, I see 
the rough braid of scars on your hide, motorboats, propellers. Whiskered and thick, you are no mermaid. A solid aunt, perhaps, comfortable in your body, spooling slowly along with your calf, your mossy back attracting small darting fish. Your kind has been on this planet 45 million years, but my kind were careless and greedy. We damaged things. Still, you ridiculous creature, with nothing but tenderness in your eyes, you keep on gliding toward me. An animal closer to home is my dog. This poem was written about my dog, Charlie. It's called Unleashed. Oh, you are a beautiful flash of purpose as you raised, race toward the geese, scattering them, every one. The wide arc of their furious flapping, their loud squawking, their beating, their clamorous lifting is like the great bells of hammered brass ringing out in the church of brave terriers on the day of infinite bones. And you, my brown and white bullet burning with joy, you are magnificent as the ringer of bells. Please allow me to be your student. Let me learn to be as purely alive as you. Next poem is called The Snore. Just as laughter can be a personal signature in a way, because everyone's laugh is unique, that is also true of the way people snore. So I explored that a little bit with this poem, The Snore. Sometimes it's no more than a loud purring, but it can grumble like a kettle coming to a boil. It can be a lawnmower, a rowdy party next door, the one you weren't invited to. Marbles rolling across the warped wood of an old forgotten drawer. It's thunder in the distance, storm clouds huffing closer. Sometimes it's full of enthusiasm. It gallops and snorts, a horse refusing to believe it's been tamed. Most often, it's beautifully raucous. It's the calls of geese flying, sorrowful and strong in their crooked formation as a huge moon rises beyond the trees, a breeze kicking up autumn in the air, the dear imperfection of the living body, unconscious signature of the beloved there beside you, even as he's far away, beyond speech, journeying to some place you can never reach. The uh, previous winter was a classic winter, only more so. And like many of my writer friends, it seemed that snow worked its way into a lot of my pieces. And that is true of this poem, which is called You Reappear. Three days of snow driving hard at the windows, a sky so heavy it barely holds itself up. And then this morning arrives, pristine. The sun, a new sun, spectacular in its sharp, cold brilliance, the whole town bathed in this intense winter light. And there you are, stamping in from the driveway, peeling off your hat, so the white hair on either side of your head sticks straight out, electric. And you squint at me as your eyes adjust to the lesser indoor illumination. You wear your humanity so plainly, washed and rewashed in the years we've shared. I confess that for days I was all but blind to you. Still at this moment I look your way and Maybe it's the angle of sun pouring through the window. The light you carry is suddenly visible. It happens like this sometimes. A shadow slips away and you reappear, fixing the closet door, 
looking up from your list of irregular galaxies, or staring into the fire, sharing your amazement at Beethoven's symphony, how magnificently it moves us. And the man himself, you say, your voice hushed and incredulous, unable to hear it, though his heart was aflame with music. The last poem I'll read takes us back to summer and to moving outside of regular time. It's called Summer Evening with Kayak. A single kayak drifts for a moment into the middle of a meditation. Across the lake, a dog barks three times and then falls silent. Tonight, the green waters seem very still. Fish rise into silky circles that pattern the lake's calm surface. Clouds, underlit, take on the colors of summer fruits. The tops of trees are still bright, though the sun slipped past the horizon. And for the man in his narrow boat, ordinary life has slipped away too. His paddle rests on his knees, swallows skim over the water. I sit on the shore as the kayaker glides silently out beyond me, but I know somehow that our minds have drifted into the same timeless space. You do not have to belong to any church. You do not have to prostrate yourself or fling coins in the direction of redemption. Just let yourself drift sometimes, unhurried, unwanting. Something like this will find you. Thank you, Ginny. I'm not quite sure how we got from uh, wormholes to uh, fake turds uh, and from there to aquatic Buddhas, but you have taken us on a wonderful journey uh, with some poems that are in this book, uh, Barbarians in the Kitchen and uh, some of your other books. Uh, we will be back again uh, for another reading in uh, this series of uh, speaking of poetry, thank you all for visiting us today.